Today, my guest is Tim Bratz. Tim is a commercial real estate broker from New York turned real estate investor. And uh, he's got over 1,400 doors. He's got uh, multiple platforms he works with. He's got uh, real estate investments where he does um, uh, single families, multifamilies, vacation homes. He's got some coaching, uh, all sorts of things. We're going to talk to him about all of that and more. And uh, we're going to get into the topic of mindset uh, when we get. Uh, uh, here in just a minute. But first, I want to remind you, if you like the show, please let us know. We would love to hear from you. You can like, share, and subscribe. And remember to leave a comment. We love to hear from our listeners. Also, if you want to check out how handsome our guests are, be sure to uh, check out our YouTube channel, Commercial Real Estate Pro Network. With that, I want to welcome my guest, Tim Bratz. Tim, welcome to CREPN Radio. Darren, I'm excited to be here, buddy. Thank you so much for, uh, for having me and, and for all the value and the content that you put out. Really appreciate it. Well, I am uh, delighted to have you this morning and, and uh, looking forward to our conversation. Um, if we could, just before we get going in, in uh, the topic of mindset, if you could take a minute and share with the listeners a little bit about your background. I, I barely... Uh, glanced at there. So if you could give us a little yeah, bit. Of you know, I, for, from a high level, um, I, I got started in real estate. I was going through college when the market was going gangbusters last time, you know, 03 to 07. And people said, hey, if you want to make a lot of money and, and get rich and build wealth and get involved in real estate. And that's what motivated a, a 20 year old kid at the time. So I ended up moving out. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, originally moved out to New York City, um, got my real estate license, thought that's how everybody got into real estate. And, um, I remember brokering, I, I, was a, I worked for a little boutique firm in Manhattan that did retail and uh, office leasing and some investment sales. And I remember uh, it took me about six months to lease my first deal and, uh, and broker a transaction. And I brokered about 400 square feet of space um, in, it was at Bleecker and Thompson in the village, uh, in Greenwich Village. And uh, I signed a lease for 400 square feet with this tenant and it was $10,000 a month with a 4% annual escalation over the course of 12 years. And I remember doing the math on it and I'm like, this landlord is going to make almost $2 million for doing something at one point in time. And he's going to get paid on it for the next uh, over a decade. And I was like, I'm on the wrong side of the coin. I need to be owning real estate instead of brokering real estate. So uh, I ended up moving down to Charleston, South Carolina, just for quality of life purposes. And um, uh, bought my first house down there. This is 2009 that I bought my first property now and, uh, bought my first house down there after the market crashed, bought it on my credit card. Cause I didn't have, you know, I'm a punk 22 year old kid. Nobody's going to give me any money or, <laughs> or credit or, uh, lend me, lend me, lend me any capital. And, um, so I put it on my credit card, bought the house, did all the work on it, flipped it. It was the first deal I've ever done in the worst real estate economy ever. And uh, I don't even know what I'm doing. And I made about $14,000 on that in like 75 days. And so um, the bug bit me and I got excited and did it again, did it again, got into wholesaling, real, like residential real estate, uh, got into more flipping of retail type HGTV kind of houses. Uh, and then I, I got into a couple of rentals and uh, a little bit of the turnkey space of flipping single family rentals for, uh, for, you know, investors, white collar professionals, entrepreneurs who wanted to invest in real estate, but maybe didn't have the, the time or the skill set to go out and, and find those deals. So um, I've done a little bit of everything in that, including buying apartment buildings, bought my first apartment building about uh, six years ago, a little over about six and a half years ago. And um, the market was was at the bottom back then. I bought a 30 unit apartment building for, or I'm sorry, I bought an eight unit apartment building for $30,000 and uh, put, wow. put another 50 grand into it. I'm into it for 10 grand a unit. And um, I saw the returns that it was kicking off and the scalability that was in that. And so, um, you know, at, at that time I, I had a management company and, and um, I've invested in some vacation rentals and stuff since and really focused um, and narrowed everything down. The only thing that I do now is buy apartment buildings. That's it. And I'm, uh, I'm actually up to 2,300 units today, a little over $200 million in portfolio value. And uh, I own apartment buildings all over uh, the Midwest, Southeast, and uh, like the South, uh, like Texas, Oklahoma, those kinds of areas. So majority of my portfolio is in, is in Georgia and South Carolina though. Gotcha. Well, that's uh, quite a, a lot you've packed in in your, your short uh, real estate career. I mean, <clears throat> um, 
You know, I think the, the thing that I, I, I love is the realization of, of uh, the, who, who's making the money in the deal. You know, like you said, with the, uh, the first space you, you uh, leased, which I, I mean, that the rent, I mean, from Portland, Oregon, that's, that's a, uh, quite a steep rent. Yeah. Uh, you know, 400 or 400 square feet for 10,000 a month. And I'm assuming at 4%, uh, 10 years is that you think that's pushing 20, 20,000 a month. I mean, that's just, yeah, it's getting there. It's, that's it's crazy right now. It's North of 15, 16, $17,000 a month. So, yeah. um, it's a significant amount. I think only New York and probably maybe only that area um, or certain areas of New York can fetch that kind of rent. Uh, but it was more the, just the realization that there's this thing called residual income and there's this thing called right. passive income and there's the opportunity to do something once and get paid on it over and over and over again. And that's how real wealth is built, right? It's not by trading your time for money. It's not by doing the transactional stuff. It's by owning assets and getting other people to pay for uh, the operating expenses on that asset, the debt service on that asset, and then also putting money in your pocket every single month. And then over time, as you pay down the principal on that asset and over time, as the property appreciates and rents go up, that's how real wealth is built, you know, by equity in, in these projects. So it's, um, that was the realization that I came to that I said, Hey, that's, I need to be on that side of the coin instead of the, the brokering transactional side of the coin. No, I, I, I love that. I, I, uh, that's very similar to the way that I got into uh, real estate, just from a mindset of, I just saw it as somebody else was going to pay my cost. Um, I had mm -hmm. no idea of, <clears throat> of, uh, appreciation. I had no, no idea about cash flow. I just knew that if, if you stayed there long enough and paid the the rent, eventually my uh, you know my note was going to be extinguished and I'd have the equity in the deal. And yep. uh, pretty simple there, but um, I love that. Um, well, so you you had a, a mind shift from the transactional side of the business to uh, building long term wealth, um, and I'm assuming. I'll let you 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 describe, but it, but it sounds like was part of that, or it was a was the kind of the key piece to that. Was it recognizing you can get paid one time versus really build wealth? Was that kind of the? Yeah, it was it was the the residual aspect, I guess, is what really caught my eye. Of um, you know, I got into this. I, I, in high school and college, I probably read two books, right? <laughs> and, then was, and then the year after I graduated from college, I, I found something which was personal finance and wealth building and it turned into real estate um, or I, it started with personal finance and wealth building. And that's really what caught my attention. And I read, I don't know, probably 30 books my first year out of college. And everything, everything wealth and, and personal finance related came back to or somehow um, mentioned real estate. And, you know, you do more research and you realize that real estate's created more millionaires and billionaires than any other industry combined. And everybody who makes money in other industries ends up putting their money into real estate. And so since the dawn of civilization, wealth has been measured in land ownership. And I knew it wasn't an experiment, right? And I knew it wasn't gonna, it wasn't a tech startup that could work, might make money, might not make money, could go bust, but could, could you know, hit the jackpot. I knew real estate, if you were willing to stick with it, you had a long-term vision, would always pay massive dividends and you can generate a ton of wealth. And, um, and, then, and then I met a lot of people in real estate and realized there's a lot of people in real estate making a lot of money and real estate's kind of an equalizer of dummies. You know, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of people who are not that intelligent making money here. And I'm like, Hey, if this guy's making money, I'm going to get rich in this, you know? Right. So right. I ended up diving a little bit deeper and deeper into real estate. And, um, uh, you know, and, and as I was learning about real estate and as I'm, I'm watching the market, um, I had a construction company. I did like some exterior painting and stuff when I was in college. And, uh, so I understood business and, and a little bit about real estate before when the market was going great. I, I interned with one of the biggest home builders in the country and, um, but I didn't buy anything before then. My dad had a couple of rental properties and stuff. Um, so I was a, a vaguely familiar with it, but not, not, deeply familiar with it. And then when I got interested in real estate, that's when the market shifted, right? So I'm seeing all these people who on paper were worth tens of millions of dollars that are completely wiped out. And then I'm seeing other people 
who maybe weren't as fancy, maybe weren't uh, uh, flaunting and didn't have these sexy projects, but they had cash flow. And, and I noticed the difference of the people who were able to either ride out the storm or the people who were able, or, or the people who went bankrupt. The difference was the people who went bankrupt all invested for speculative appreciation. They thought if they bought here tomorrow, it would be worth this much. Um, and when it wasn't worth more, they ended up losing everything versus the people on this side of the coin who uh, bought for cash flow, not for these big, you know, sexy, exciting um, pops of cash, but for cash flow and buying things where they knew that they had a tenant base in there that would pay the expenses, pay the debt service, put cash in their pocket. Even if values go to zero, they knew that they could still cover all their expenses and cover their debt, pay down their mortgage, put money in their pocket. There's still value to that, right? And what I, what, what I then realized a couple of years later is they were the only people that were still bankable when the banks weren't lending to anybody, they were still lending to these people who had cash flow and had assets and had big balance sheets. And those are the people who were able to buy everything when the market shifted and now are exiting a lot of properties or have a net worth that's four or five times as great as what it was 10 years ago or eight years ago, even just because they were able to buy things for pennies on the dollar. So it's uh, uh, my entire business today is, is, you know, a, uh, um, has been created and structured off of that. So the only thing that I buy now is, is apartment buildings, B-class working workforce kind of apartment buildings. I don't get into the, the hood. I don't get into C and D-class type stuff. I don't get into luxury stuff. I buy in A and B-class neighborhoods, working force type housing, rents from $700 to $1,400 a month is kind of our ballpark. And uh, that's it. And we buy at wholesale prices. I will not pay retail price. I find off market deals direct to seller. I negotiate directly with the seller. Um, if I, I've taken my, my single family background and just taken that into commercial real estate, um, and just said, Hey, if I need to be all into a single family house in order to flip it for 65% of that after repair value, why, why wouldn't I duplicate that exact same formula into apartment buildings? And so I have. So everything that I buy, I'm all into for 65% of what it can appraise for, um, uh, what the valuation would be once it's stabilized. The difference is I don't sell my apartment buildings. I just turn around and I refinance it You know, at 75% loan to value. I'm able to pull off or pay off um, enough money to uh, pull out enough money to pay off my bridge loan, pay, pay off my equity investors, and then have a, some spread of, of refinance proceeds that make me more liquid that allow me to then go and buy more properties. Uh, you just went through a lot there that, that to me is, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I love all of it because <clears throat> a couple of things that I heard, um, uh, you mentioned that you, you, you spent some time uh, working with a mentor, getting an education. Um, and I'm just curious, can you speak a little bit to, you know, to me that that's kind of where you, you get your, your base of, of knowledge so that you can recognize what, what others are doing or what they're not doing or how to play in the marketplace. Um, was this after college or was this before? It wasn't quite clear on, on if that was, uh, you sound like you were working as a contractor for a while. Yeah. So, I, I mean, during college, in, this, in the college summer breaks, I would go out and paint houses and, and that's how I made money. So, I actually started my own company. I, I hired a bunch of college buddies. I had crews of 12 to 15 guys um, and crews of like three or four at a time. So, I'd, I'd three, we'd be painting three houses at a time. I just did all the sales and the marketing type stuff and uh, we would go out and uh, just paint houses all summer. So that's how I paid to go and travel in Europe and study abroad and um, paid for my going out expenses in college and stuff uh, just by, by working over the summer. So I had that entrepreneurial bug. And then after college, I ended up, uh, I've had a lot of mentors, right? Most of them were bad initially because I couldn't judge people and their character and what their, uh, 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 you know, their, their motives were, I guess. And so for me, I had a lot of good mentors. I had a lot of bad mentors and it's, I learned things from both of them um, on how I wanted to build a business and how I didn't want to be perceived by the marketplace and like things like that. So um, one of the most important things 
that you can do that I, I think when you're getting in any endeavor is finding a mentor or finding a mastermind group that you can plug into and uh, uh, you know joining a mastermind I joined my first mastermind went to the first round table and you know what a mastermind is it's you know probably anywhere from two people to 20 people sitting in a room or, or, or more even and just sharing collective ideas and strategies and things that have worked and things that have not worked and what was powerful for me to go sit in a room of about 12 people was to say, Hey, here's, here's where I am in my business. And I feel stuck. And there were other, other people in the room and their brain power and their experience. They said, Hey, I was there 18 months ago. I was there five years ago. Here's all that I did that you need to do. And you're going to be able to punch through that ceiling. Or here's what I did that I wish I didn't do. And um, I don't want you to make the same mistakes that I made. And by joining a mastermind group or having a mentor and meeting with them on a regular basis, at least quarterly, um, it, it has, it has put me on a trajectory to acquire $200 million worth of real estate in essentially the past four years or so. Um, I started building my current portfolio in, in August of 2015. So I've, I've picked up 2,500 units. Um, we'll close on another 200 next week. So I'll be at 2,500 units, um, in less than, uh, actually, we'll, we'll probably be at 3,000 units because I got another 600 closing in July. So we'll be at over 3,000 units and probably $250 million worth of property in, uh, um, in four years. How have I been able to do that is because people realize they go out to an event and they like, oh, I got the information that I needed to punch through the ceiling and get to that next level. The difference though is at the next level, there's another level of problems there, right? So. Right you need to be able to go plug back in and say, Hey, all right, great. Got past that. Now here's my next level of problem. Who can help me with this? Here's what anybody faced this in the past. Yes, I have. And then all of a sudden it comes full circle. So I'm in mastermind groups where I get a lot out of, and I give a lot, you know, um, based on my experience and the things that I've been able to go through and sharing of resources. It's, it's, that is the number one thing that I would advise any beginner or anybody getting involved in any endeavor, especially real estate, is find a phenomenal mentor or find a, a, a mastermind group that you can plug into. Because here's the thing, you're going to pay for it probably one way or another. You're either going to pay for it to be out in the group or, or pay a mentor to help you coach. There's some people who might be able to help out and, and not charge you anything. That's phenomenal. Um, but if you don't find a mentor, if you don't find a group that you can plug into on a regular basis, you're going to pay for that education by losing money, you know, getting, getting kicked in the, in the teeth by contractors, uh, uh, you know, having, having, not having the right insurance in place, like a lot of things like that, that you'll pay for the education and it'll take a lot longer if you have to go through those learning curves on your own versus, um, you know, just hiring uh, a mentor, hiring a coach or hiring or joining a mastermind or finding somebody that can help, um, uh, you know, help you navigate your, your success in your business. No, I, I love it. I, uh, you know, you can self mentor or you can, uh, you know, join a, a mentorship. And that's, I right, think that's they, what I did for a long time, man. And I was banging my head against the wall for a while. And then I plugged into this, uh, my good buddy, Mark Evans is a good friend. Now, uh, went out to his event and it was just like, it was mind boggling, you know, it was so simple to them. And it was just like this thing. Like you, sometimes you can't see outside of your current situation, right? Sometimes you're just, you're so, there's so much fog right in front of your face that you can't see from a higher level. And you just need somebody that you respect and somebody that, uh, you know, has been there to say, Hey, here's all you got to do. And that's, that's what I did. You know? Yeah. No, I think we're all limited by our own experience. You know, if you, unless you have somebody that's been there and, and knows that's the, a great way of saying the, it. Uh, uh, the shortcut, uh, you're going to, you know, try and scale the wall or, you know, go mm -hmm. around the wall or whatever, when there's a, a door you know, no, over here, go through there. Um, okay. So uh, I love the, the mentor uh, mindset and, in getting plugged into, you know, people with experience and, and whether you join a, uh, a mastermind, uh, group where you, you know, hire mentors or whatever, but, but something to help guide you through this path. And, and also, uh, I wonder what, what your, your thoughts are and how, how valuable they are to keep you on the path. Yeah, I, I, I think I do a lot of self-reflection on where I am. I mean, that, that's, that's what made me shift my business about three, yeah, about three years ago to only doing apartment buildings. I had a couple hundred units that I was passively invested in and I looked and I sat back and I looked at my net worth 
and I looked at where I was spending my time and 90% of my net worth was coming from my apartments, but it was only 10% of my time. And I'm thinking I was flipping a lot of houses at the time. I was making money, but I wasn't building wealth. Right. And so I, I think to answer your question, Darren, I do a lot of self-reflection and uh, take a look at where I want to be, what my goals are. I don't, I don't just kind of let the wind blow me in whatever direction I go. I look at opportunities. Um, but if, but, but I, I know what my destination is, you know, I, I mean, I have a four year old daughter and she watches all these Disney movies and we were watching, um, uh, Alice in Wonderland the other day and Alice in Wonderland, you know, she shrinks and goes into Wonderland and she's following this path and chasing this, uh, this little bunny rabbit down the hole and all that stuff. And she comes to a fork in the road. Okay. And she, and all of a sudden that Cheshire cat, the, the invisible cat appears and, uh, she goes, okay, hey, there, there's, there's two directions. Which direction should I go in? And the Cheshire cat goes, well, where do you want to go? She goes, well, I'm not really quite sure. He goes, well, I guess it doesn't matter which road you take then, right? <laughs> so, right. and I think a lot of people go through life like that. They don't know what their destination is. And because of that, they don't know what path they should be on. And for me, I know what my destination is. So I can then reverse engineer the path and the roadmap in order to get there. And, and I think that's a really, really critical piece where people come to me a lot and they're like, Hey, how do I do this? How do I do? Well, one, you got to figure out why you want to do it. And two, you know, what does that actually look like? We can quantify it. Here's what your income needs to be in the next five years, 10 years, whatever, in order to accomplish those goals. And then let's figure out how many properties you need to pick up, how many offers you need to make and all, what all that stuff looks like in order to, uh, in order to put you on that path. So, um, yeah, uh, hopefully that helped answer a little no, bit. I, I, I love that because, again, it, it starts with you got to know where you want to go. Yeah, and if you so don't, it's, you don't it's have figuring a, out self-reflection on me, yeah. knowing where I want to be, and then no, like knowing the right questions to ask or like asking better questions to my mentors. And I found that the better the questions you ask, the better the answers you get, right? And the best questions get the best answers. And so um, there's a lot of people who say, oh, I can't do that, or I couldn't figure that out, or I got this, this limitation and all this other stuff, and that shuts down your brain from thinking. When you start asking yourself questions of how could I do this, how could I make that happen, how could I uh, not flip a house a month, but how could I flip five houses a month or 10 houses a month, or how could I not pick up one apartment building this year, how can I pick up one apartment building a month, it gets your wheels turning in a different capacity. How could I pick up 20 apartment buildings um, this year? Now you realize that doing what you're doing right now, you have to think and, and act in a different way and it gets your wheels cranking. It's easy to go from buying one apartment building a year to two apartment buildings a year. You just do more of the current activity that you're doing. Right. But in order to buy 25 or 30 apartment buildings a year, you have to shift up your activity or think about it in a different way and figure out how do I scale this? Uh, there's different things, different systems, different people, different uh, uh, processes that I have to put in place in order to build a business that, that, that works at that level. And so, um, again, it's just asking yourself different questions and, and kind of getting outside your own box. And, um, I mean, I, I personally reflect at least once a quarter where I take a day, turn off the phone, turn off the internet, just review my goals, review, um, uh, my net worth, where I want to be on all this stuff, and then, uh, figure that out. And then I know the better questions that I can ask my mentors in order to help me, you know, advance that path in order to get there. Let's uh, back up here a second. When you were talking about, you know, shifting from buying one, one a year to two a year to deciding you can buy, you know, one a month or, or whatever that is. Um, what is your, because uh, there's multiple hurdles in that, that way. I mean, if you're buying one a year, uh, you find the deal, you, you got your, you know, due diligence, you got your bank, you, you know, if you're going to do it on your own, you know, if the bank, uh, if the if the property makes sense and your balance sheet makes sense, then then that's kind of a uh, an easier task. But if you're going into you know you're going to buy one a month, I'm assuming that your your credit card that you used before maybe uh you know out of limit or you may you, you, you capped know, out you, pretty quick. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> how how do, how have you and 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 how do you think of as far as in mindset on how to uh to to get from that? I mean just because again, the, the the one model has a very limited amount of capacity, but now if you talk about going 10x on that capacity, uh, money is going to be an issue. And I and I wanted to dig into this a little bit because I, I thought I heard you say that you uh, your buy and hold uh, is that your strategy, but yet you've yep. got 
investors. And I, I think that uh, one of the things that's always been kind of a, a challenge for me in, in my mind is that I, I believe in buying a home. I mean, I just think that long term, the, the, the property, if it's a good property, why would I want, want to get rid of it, right? Um, but I get the mindset of a, whether it be a, a flip or a um, syndication, if you're, if you're bringing other people in, they don't want to stay in as long as you do. So you got to get, away, got to get them out. Mm -hmm. So I guess if, if I could ask you to, uh, I don't know if it's necessarily a mindset question, but just a how you structure and how you go from uh, you yourself to others so that you can scale your operation uh, and then retain ownership. Cause I think that's, that's something I'm not, I, I don't hear that very often. And I, I'd yeah. love to hear that. So, so there's two things I want to talk on on this. Um, I have two thoughts right now. One is kind of more of a mindset business building shift. And then two is more the tactical of how I structure these things. So keep me on point in case I, I yeah. veer off here. Okay. First I want to talk about, building a big business and building uh, in a big way. And I'm, I, I'm trying to think of an analogy for you, Darren, but I think like exercising is probably a good one. And what I have found is success in really life is all about consistency, right? It's showing consistent action over time and letting that consistent action compound and create momentum. And then you create these extraordinary results. And us as entrepreneurs, we are, the only thing we're really consistent at is being inconsistent is what I found, you know? Right. And, and there's a lot of people who are, who are really good at being inconsistent. And so as I'm, as I'm talking to you and as you're asking me this question, I'm thinking it's kind of like working out. All right. First of the year, everybody wants to make more money and lose weight, right? So everybody gets a gym membership and then they go and start working out and they exercise. And for, 30 days, they, they sweat and their muscles ache and they're crying because they're in so much pain and they don't want to get out of bed and they're tired and they're exhausted and all this stuff. And yet they're going to the gym. Even if you go every single day, you know how much of a difference you see in 30 days? Not much, right? Because you're just getting it going. But after then 60 days, 90 days, 120 days, 180 days, finally somebody says, Darren, you look pretty good, man. You're losing a little bit of weight. Your face looks a little bit trimmer. Your chest puffed out a little bit more. Like, you look pretty good, man. You've been, you've been, dude, I've been working out every day for the past 180 days, bleeding, crying, sweating. Like it's, it's been aching. It's, it's been nothing but pain that I've been going through. And I think that's what kicks a lot of people off because they don't see immediate results and those results don't really compound until three months, six months, 12 months later. And so you have to know that it will set in eventually. Um, but a lot of people get off. And, and, and the, the biggest thing is once you're, once you're 180 days out, you don't need to work out two hours every day and pump iron every single day uh, for two hours. You need to go and work out for 20 minutes every other day and you'll maintain the momentum and the, the, the body mass and the, the muscle mass and all those things that you, that you have currently, it doesn't take as much work once you hit that, that certain level, right? Versus you fall off after 30 days or 60 days and you go and start it again a year later, the next January, and you have to start from the ground up again. It's like a plane taking off. A plane uses up 80% of its fuel that it uses on a, on a standard flight in the takeoff. Once it's up in the air, it uses the other 20% of the fuel. And that's right. even though that's, you know, 90% of the flight or 95% of the flight and only five or 10% of the flight is the takeoff, majority of the fuel is used on the takeoff. That's the same thing in business. That's the same thing in exercise or, or your, your health. You just got to get it past that point. And then it doesn't take that much to sustain and to maintain. And it's actually easier to build a bigger business and to maintain your health and sustain the airplane than it is to do the takeoff. So once you get past that, that part, it's, it's not that difficult. Like for me, all it is is just consistent marketing. It's putting out social media messages and emailing my groups and, and, and doing it on a consistent basis. And I've been doing it so consistently. I'm not the biggest investor in Cleveland, Ohio. There's, there's people um, in Cleveland who have 15,000 units and uh, massive portfolios, but I'm probably the best known real estate investor in all of Cleveland because everybody knows Tim Bratz buys apartment buildings because I've been telling everybody that for the past three years consistently. And right. so now whenever a deal comes across anybody's desk, 
they'll send it over to my team, my team reviews it, we get first crack at those deals, just because we're the best known and because we've been consistent over time. Does that make sense though? Oh, totally, I, and I, I and think it's the same that- thing with raising private money. I've been planting yeah. seeds every single day for the past three years, and now it's easy for me to raise money. I raised $1.8 million this week from a webinar, you know, uh, for a deal that's closing next week, and I can do that now. Um, because it's easy for me because I've, I've consistently planted seeds and I have the relationships now and it's compounding versus not talking to anybody about raising any money or doing any deals for a year and having to restart up that engine 12 months from now. It's going to take a lot more time to go and raise that capital and, and find that deal flow and get things going again. But once you hit momentum, it's unbelievable the way the snowball effect works. So, um, that's that's one part that I want to talk. Do you right. have any questions no, I, on that? No, I, I just I think the, the the beauty in that is the the fighting through to where you you know you you've done the work to where now you're on the momentum you, you mm -hmm. to, to build the momentum. I mean, I think that's the that's the phase that people get lost in is that because it, it, it's not going to work right out of the chute, right? You're not going to have everybody line up at your door and say, no. "God, <clears throat> Tim, I didn't know you bought apartments." Holy crap! You know, I mean, I've got money and I don't know what to do with it. That yep. just doesn't happen, right? Yeah, but it's a that consistent. But here's the thing. There'll be more of that than you, than you think, right? Like if, right. if you don't tell people that you're buying apartments that you bring on investors, they don't know to come to you saying, hey, I'm sitting on $200,000 in my 401k. Darren, oh, oh, I had no idea. You do that? Okay. Well, now you're, you're at least, hey, it's not available right now, but it'll be available six months from now. And then you're making notes in your, in your, and now six months from now, it's way easier to raise money because you've had that many conversations with that many people who have money coming out of other deals over the next six months that, boom, 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 all of a sudden, it looks like you're an overnight success, but it, it, it's taken many, many months of laying that foundation, right? Let me ask you this. Uh, you've had your own experience, and it sounds like you, you've worked with others, mentored others, and, and maybe you can speak to just kind of a, is there a timeline that you see as a, as a mandatory kind of a, a minimum someone needs to commit to, to start to see the, the seeds of, or, or their their success. And I mean, I'm sure there's like people, God, I couldn't believe it. I just talked to my one neighbor and he, I didn't know he had $2 million. Like, you know, <laughs> I mean, exactly. I'm sure those are, those happen, but I yeah. mean, just from, from an overall perspective, um, is there I, any kind so, of a, so I, I, I don't do any like one-on-one -on -one mentorship. I, I do a little bit of coaching and I have an event that I, that I put on called commercial empire that I, that I do about four times a year. And a lot of times I partner up with students and stuff and I teach them how to go out and find deals and um, how to manage contractors. And then I really take a lot of the heavy lifting, which is the financing and the raising of capital and some of like the, the back office administrative type stuff, management, asset management, portfolio management, that kind of stuff. We take that off their plate if they want to partner with us. Uh, Cause that's what we're really good at. What we're not really good at is being kind of like boots on the ground and, you know, going to the property every single day. That that's a lot of time consumption for us. So it's a way that we can partner with people who have time, but maybe not have access to the money. And then, um, you know, gets us involved in more deals, gets them involved in deals that they can't, couldn't normally do. And we're able to each, you know, share in a piece of the pie there. So, um, like that's, that's, I guess the extent of how I mentor, how I coach and, 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 uh, what I do on that front. But I mean, there's people who I sit down with, or they come out to my event and they'll say, Hey, um, Tim, I did the stuff that you did. And, and there was a guy, Dan Mitchin, a good buddy of mine. Uh, he's a local real estate agent, never owned a rental property before in his life, comes out to my event and starts making offers, doing exactly what I told him to do, calling for sale by owners, calling for rent by owners, letting everybody in his network know that he's looking for apartment buildings to buy and um, uh, knocking on doors and all this, all this other stuff. And he ends up getting a 74 unit apartment complex under contract no, I'm sorry, 78 unit apartment complex under contract in less than 60 days. So, but he's a consistent action taker, right? It wasn't going out and it's not eating an apple. It, it's not eating. It's, it, I'm sorry. It is eating an apple a day keeps the doctor away, not eating seven apples on Sunday, right? It's consistent right. action over time is what creates these results. And so I, I firmly believe that in six months, you can absolutely come across a deal and find a deal if you're putting in consistent efforts. Um, now, and now, you know, is making one phone call a day consistent effort? I mean, it is if it's daily action, but is it enough? Probably not enough to like re really see results. I would say minimum 10 phone calls a day, five days a week, gets about 200 offers out there per month, or at least 200 you know, conversations going per month. 
you're going to see some results from that. Right. And uh, there's going to be deals, especially if you're looking for deals that are under 100 units. There's millions of apartment buildings out there across the country that you can find in, in that regard. And, um, and even if you're looking at only deals over 100 units, there's still almost 50,000 apartment buildings across the country that, uh, um, that are over 100 units. And, and you do one of those a year for five years, financial futures changed. Right, right. No, I, I appreciate you just kind of reiterating the consistency is the key to that. There's not really a, a timeline. It's just, you know, if you be consistent, you will get results. I mean, that's, that's kind of what I got from that. Uh, let's go back to your uh, tactical. I mean, I think maybe you sure. might've talked a little bit about that just from a standpoint of uh, how you do your, your coaching and, and your marketing is what I kind of uh, picked up on is that you're, the, the messaging, you've constantly got the message out there. So people know to think of you, which that's, I mean, marketing, I, I, uh, you know, I remember I got a degree in marketing in college and at the time sales and marketing were this kind of a gooey ball that, you know, it was just this one thing that nobody had ever really separated it. And yeah. I think today we truly know what marketing is. Marketing is making certain that people, when they're ready, they know where to go. Mm -hmm. And if you've put your message out there, you'll be, you know, on the list. Yeah. It's right? a great way of putting it. Um, and then sales, sales is just an educational process. It's letting right. people know what you do, how you do it and, and letting them know that there's an opportunity there. And um, you know, for me, I think marketing and people are always an investment in your business. You'll always see a return on those things. Everything else is probably an expense, but those two things are always, and I was a marketing major also, um, learned most of my marketing after college, but you know what I mean? Um, so, so one of the things that, that I realized in transitioning into apartment buildings is that residential investors, which is what my, you know, what, what I was involved in all the time, uh, what my specialty was before I really leveraged into apartment buildings. Um, and a lot of my network was all residential investors and wholesalers and brokers and agents and contractors and vendors on the residential side. And what I realized is those people come across apartment building deals, but they have zero clue on how to underwrite them. So what they do is they discard those leads. They throw them all away. And so what I did is I have this, this database that I built up of all these residential agents and brokers, and it's, you know, thousands and actually tens of thousands of people today. Um, and I just drip them an email every week saying, I'm looking to buy apartment buildings. If you have any apartment buildings, please send them to me. I will either pay you a wholesale fee or a brokerage commission or bring you in as a, as a small equity partner for referring the deal to us. And by sending that message out, you wouldn't believe the number of leads and like, I just bought a, oh, about a year ago, I bought a 48 unit apartment building. I'm all into for 1.9 million. We're in the process of refinancing it today after, you know, renovating it, stabilizing it. It'll appraise for probably $3.5 million. Wow. A 40, and you know what it came from? It came from a, a residential wholesaler, some girl who called up somebody about a single family house that that owner didn't want to sell their single family house, but they said, Hey, I have this apartment building that, that I don't want anything to do with anymore. I've owned it for 25 years. It's falling apart. If anybody wants it, you know, let me know. She goes, I don't know anybody. I don't know. I don't know about apartment buildings. Like I, I can't help you there. She gets my email a couple of days later says, Hey, I, I don't know if there could any, anything could come from this, but let me send it over to these guys. We end up taking a look at it. It's a home run deal. We end up buying it. We send her a check for $14,000 just for making an email introduction for us. And she gets a big win. The seller gets their price point. We get it for a smoking deal. There was a, it was a heavy lift. We had to put a lot of work into it, but now we've got $1.6 million of equity in a property and we're in it for 55 cents on the dollar, you know? Right. And you probably got a new, uh, best bird dog, uh, in the, right. uh, you know, out there that, Oh my God. Friends, and now yeah, she's yeah, looking yeah. for apartment buildings. Yeah. Right. And yeah. then, and then all of a sudden now she knows us now, now every apartment building deal that comes across her plate, she lets us know about it. How many relationships can you build like that over the course of a few years? And until you have that momentum built up where people are sending you deals every single week. So that's, that's what we've been able to do. But, um, so Go ahead. There's, there's two things that, that uh, I want to make sure we get to here. Um, you talked about marketing and into these building your list here and that, cause you, what, what I'm hearing you say is that you, you're going direct to the seller as opposed to through the, the traditional broker mm -hmm. uh, uh, channels. And 
but it doesn't sound like you're the one making all the calls. You're not uh, cold calling. You, you are again marketing to the people that are marketing to these these people. Is we it do both. My, okay? Yep. Is that, okay. We do both. My, my acquisitions guy, you know, he makes outbound phone calls on for rent by owners, for sale by owners. He's making offers on things um, through brokers still. And, and you know, you get to a point where once you have the momentum, you're known as one of the big buyers in town. So then all of a sudden you get all the broker deals too. The issue is here's, here's the thing with going through brokers. And I see a lot of like these gurus out there who teach apartment investing saying, Hey, go build broker relationships. That's, that's what it's all about. No, it's not about that. Especially if you're new, because think about there's a lot of regulations on the residential side of things where, uh, there's red tape in place or uh, as it should be, because there's people who are not sophisticated landowners owning property in the residential space. There's, you know, some, some 16 year old girl inherited property and her grandparents gave it to her, right? She doesn't know anything about what to do with that property. And there need to be laws and regulations in place that, that protect somebody like that, that say, hey, if, a, if an agent gets a commission, or I'm sorry, if an agent gets a listing, they need to put it on the MLS within 72 hours to protect the seller, right? To make sure it gets full exposure and to make sure that that agent's not just trying to, you know, get both sides of the commission and shop it on their own. In, in commercial real estate, it's a, it's a wild, wild west. There is no regulations. Everybody's assumed to be a sophisticated investor if you're buying property for investment purposes. So you're a big boy, Darren. You know, it's, uh, time, f- time for you to act like a big boy and, and uh, be a big boy and you can watch out for yourself, right? Buyer beware kind of a thing. But the same thing uh, applies to brokers or uh, it does not apply to brokers. It's, it's wild, wild west for them. So when they get a listing, you got to think about it from a broker's perspective. A broker doesn't want to co-broke a $10 million apartment building. A broker wants both sides of that commission. So they're not going to go and put it on the MLS and have to split their commission 50, 50 if they don't have to. So they don't. So what they do is they keep it as a pocket listing. They know who the top 15 buyers are in town. They make phone calls to those top 15 buyers. They shop the deal around. And then if all those 15 buyers say no to the deal, then they put it on the MLS and they put it on LoopNet, and then everybody sees it. So when you go and you, and you go build a broker relationship or you see something that's on LoopNet, it's a bad deal because the top 20 people already said no to it, right? So if you understand that, that psychology and that dynamic of broker relationships, now is not the time to build broker. Like now's the time to find off market, direct to seller. It's the only way that you're going to find deals. Um, unless you are one of the top 15 buyers in town, right. then you're going to get that deal flow. Uh, but for me, no, we're going direct to seller and we're making those phone calls. We're putting out direct mail. Um, we're, we're contacting and kind of uh, doing the, the outbound hunting um, on all that stuff. And then we're also letting people know who are not other investors, and maybe they are other investors, that we're buying apartment buildings and send us all your stuff. So that way we have an army of thousands of people out there looking for deals as well, or, or at least aware that we're buying deals in case they come across something. No, I, I love it. Again, it's, it, and it, it, uh, just understanding the, the law of numbers. I mean, you can do so many calls yourself, but if you have multiple people making calls, I mean, that's how you're going to get that deal flow. Yep. Uh, in yep. there. Absolutely. Um, I absolutely want to make certain we get a chance to talk a little bit about the way you structure your deals. Sure. Uh, from the standpoint of, of uh, your, the, in, in, it wasn't clear to me, are you, are you bringing in equity partners? Or are you bringing in debt or how are you structuring these? Because I, what I thought I heard you say is that you're, you're keeping these deals. And so you're, you're either cashing your partners out or can you talk a little bit about that? Cause that's not something that I've heard a lot, a lot of people. So talk I, about. I don't, I don't syndicate like traditional syndicators do. Mm-hmm. I, again, I, I never went to Wharton school of business. I don't have initials behind my name from, getting a commercial investing degree. I don't come from a family where my great, great grandpa was a big real estate investor. I started this stuff on my own. Right. And so I just did it the way that I thought would be fair and uh, would be fair to everybody involved. And so I don't buy traditional retail price apartment building deals at five caps and six caps and seven caps, every deal, all 3000 units that I'll own, um, you know, in the next 60 days, I'll be at 3000 units. Every single one of them yields between a 10 to 17% cap rate at oh. my cost basis. Okay. Unheard well, that, of. That's okay. acquisition at acquisition purchase. No, 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 not at acquisition. 
No, okay. it's, it's usually I'm buying distressed. That's at my cost basis between purchase price and okay. renovation cost. So after, okay. After repairs, gotcha. after stabilization, gotcha. which usually takes me 12 to 18 months on any given deal. Okay. So what I do is I'm looking for distressed sellers, right? Anything that's, that's already stabilized. There's nobody, uh, why, why would they sell it if it's already cash flowing and making money? Right? So they're going to get a retail price for that. Whoever that seller is me, I don't believe in paying retail price for anything. So I am always looking for motivated sellers in some capacity. And usually it's distressed property, physically distressed, management distressed, whatever that looks like. So we're going in and we're finding deals that usually need some work. They need some TLC. It's typically um, an entrepreneur who got into real estate because they made a bunch of money in their primary business and then, you know, didn't treat real estate the, with the amount of respect that it <laughs> that they should have. And they just get clobbered um, in the marketplace. Management takes advantage of them. They don't have a local partner or anything like that. And they end up losing the property. That's one of the people I buy from typically. And then the other person is, is like this, uh, this lady on the 48 unit over here, owned it for 30 years, sucked a hundred percent of the cash out of it, never reinvested another dime into the property. And then um, uh, eventually after 30 years, the roof goes, you know, the windows go, the mechanicals go, the parking lot goes, and she wasn't financeable and, and didn't have any cash to put back into the apartment building. And they're, they're painting themselves into a corner where they have to sell. So those are usually the two, two people that I, that I buy from, um, or it's, it's usually a story that falls into one of those two realms. Um, so we go in and we're usually buying properties that need a ton of work. Uh, but I like that because now I can force appreciation. I don't have to wait for appreciation over five, seven, right. 10 years like a traditional syndicator does. I can put in the value add. I can create sweat equity by forcing, uh, or by, by forcing appreciation and by, uh, by doing all the work on these apartment buildings. So we're able to come in and, um, you know, we renovate all the exteriors, we renovate all the interiors, then we go to the existing tenant base, uh, we fill up all the vacancies, we go to the existing tenants, we have a conversation with them saying, hey, you're paying way below market rate rent, you see the value we're bringing to the table, if you'll sign a new lease at market rate rent, we'll, uh, we'll make some improvements to your unit, blah, 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 and, and majority of those people end up signing new leases at market rate rent, sometimes two, three hundred dollars more than what their current rental rate is, just because they see the value we're bringing, and then, you know, probably, 30% of the people move out and that's okay because they probably weren't taking care of the property. They probably weren't respecting right. the other tenants and, the, and they leave, we renovate those units and we get them all rented out at market rate rent. And so that process takes 12 to 18 months on average, depending on the size of the building <clears throat> and the team we have working on it. And so what I do is I'll raise money like on this, on a, on a, the deal I'm closing next, next week, round numbers. I'm all in for about $7 million and it's worth about almost $11 million. Okay. So I'm, let's just, let's use, let's use easier numbers. Let's say I'm, I'm into it for six and um, it's worth 10. Okay. Just for rounder okay. numbers. So I'm into it for six. It's worth 10. Uh, I buy it and renovate it. We're buying it for 5 million. We're putting another million dollars work into it putting better management in place. We're able to increase the income, decrease the expenses, which increases the net, which is how mm -hmm. all these properties are valued based on a, a, ver or a, a multiple of the net or a cap rate valuation of the net income. And so by doing that over the course of you know, 12, 18 months, we're able to significantly increase the value. So let's say I, on 6 million bucks, I think we're raising 2 million and the bank's bringing us you know, 1.5, or I'm sorry, 4.5 or something like that. <clears throat> something in that ballpark. Um, so, so we're able to uh, get construction, short-term bridge financing for 80% of the value, let's say, then we raise the other 20% of the equity and then, uh, we, we go to work, right? So we raise from equity investors. The difference between my, the way that I structure my deals and the way that other people structure their deals is I pay a pref return regardless of the property's performance. So in traditional syndications, people only get paid, their invest, equity investors only get paid based on the property's performance. That, that, uh, that operator's earning a fee, an acquisition fee, the operator's earning an asset management fee, and yet the, the investors are only getting paid when the property starts performing. I've seen equity investors be involved in deals for four or five years and never see a dime of cash flow until the property sells. Right. Return. right. For me, 
I, it, it doesn't sit right. You know, it's not congruent. It's not fair. You're not the boat rowing in the same direction together, the investors and the operator. So for me, I said, Hey, I'm not going to take an acquisition fee. I'm not going to take an asset management fee. I'm going to pay you a pref return 10% regardless of the property's performance. And I can do that because it's just the cost of the deal. You know, the roof's this much and the windows are this much and the flooring's this much. And my interest reserve is this much because I know I can stabilize the deal in 12, 18 months. So, so I could put an interest reserve, even if the property's not performing it well enough, I could pay them out of an interest reserve where they're still getting checks every quarter, you know, for their pref payment. So now builds belief, they love it. They, they see an actual return on their investment, gives them a lot of confidence in me and confidence in the project. It gets my team motivated because we're only compensated and when the property refinances. So once we get to the refi stage, stabilize in 12 months, or 15 months, and then we refinance after you know another 90 days thereafter, we can turn around and slap a 70, 75% loan to value loan on this thing. We're only into it for, you know, let's say it's a 70% loan, we're into it for six million bucks. <clears throat> that pays back the investors, the equity investors, their capital. So now they don't have any money in play, right? They made 10% of their money while it was in play for 18 months, and it's short term, so it has more velocity than, than a traditional syndication. And then, uh, um, and then my, my bridged loan is paid off. And then we have a uh, long-term debt in place, agency loan, you know, 30 year amortization, 10 year term, 12 year term, uh, maybe a year or two of interest only, and then a uh, uh, fixed interest rate. So, so now it's only house money in play, non-recourse loan also. My investors got paid back and then I give them equity in the deal, but it's not 80% equity. It's usually, uh, 10 to 30% equity, someone that, let's say 20% equity on average, which you tell that to a traditional syndicator or somebody who invests in traditional syndications, like why the hell would I ever do that? <clears throat> because if I give you 20% equity in my deal and you have a, a fixed rate of return of 10%, regardless of the property's performance, and I can turn over your money every 18 months, there's velocity on that capital. You made 10% on your money over the course of five years in deals with me and you have 20% equity in three different deals and you have all your money back versus investing in one deal that you only got paid if the property performed and you're selling the property after five years to get the return that you're looking for. And yeah, maybe you have 70% equity in it, but you don't, you're not holding an asset anymore. In, in my deals, my investors invest with me, they earn a fixed return, plus they have all their money back and then they right. still maintain the cash flow in perpetuity and then they have equity in perpetuity and they get a percentage of the, of the uh, refi proceeds. So I, I would put my deals toe to toe against traditional syndication deals any day and show an investor that their returns are better with the, me than a tr traditional syndication. It has been a hurdle of educating traditional syndication investors of why my model is better because on the surface, it, it, they only look at the equity. But if you look at the return and the long-term play, it allows us to hold onto these properties and build true legacy wealth by doing it that way. Yeah, no, when, when I uh, first was listening to you, I thought maybe you'd mixed up the equity with the debt word there, <clears throat> uh, just as the way you're paying people, you know, with the, the continuing of the, uh, I mean, that you're giving them a, a rate, almost sounds like you're, you know, getting debt finance or you're, you're, uh, you got a debt investor that uh, has put up their, their money and you're paying an interest rate and then you're going to, you know, cash them out, give them money back. Uh, but the fact that you, you that they stay in with the uh, equity, uh, I mean, to me, I would think that anybody that, that understands it would totally want their money back and a uh, continuation of some sort of, a, uh, you know, an equity ownership and, and uh, payments. That makes a lot of sense. And, and, and here's the other thing that it does for me, Darren. <clears throat> I don't have to go and raise a ton of money every like every year for the next five or six or seven years until this money turns over. No, I that's what I was, I was, that was the other thing I was saying. That's beautiful because now, I now you've got money for 12 months and I raise 5 million bucks a month closing deals. And that money just keeps on turning over every 12 months with the right. same exact investors. Cause nobody wants their money back. They want to roll it into another deal and another deal and another deal, especially right. after they see it work once they're like, Oh my gosh, this is unbelievable. Cause the tax advantages, they're not getting like on the 10% pref, they're getting taxed as if it's a long-term capital gains when the property sells. They're not getting taxed as if on earned income this year. So they don't even pay taxes on that dividend that I'm paying them. Um, 
right now. So the tax advantages of, of being an equity owner in these projects too, and the way that I structure it, and I've spent tens of thousands of dollars with attorneys and CPAs and everything to structure it this way. Um, but again, I put it toe to toe against anything. Like there's nothing else better out there for them than, uh, than the projects that they're, that they're working on with me. So um, they want to roll the money forward over and over and over again. And now we can, and then they see me as a partner. Somebody dangles a 12% carrot in front of their, their eyes. They don't even look at it because Tim's my partner. Tim's my boy. I'm going to keep on investing with Tim because, because we're in buildings, apartment, we own apartment buildings together. We're going to own them together for the next 10, 15, 20 years and really build true wealth that way. So it's a cool way that we can, uh, that we can partner up and, and, uh, build wealth together, you know? Yeah. And I think the, the, uh, uh, the point that, that you, you bring that, you know, you don't hear what the traditional syndication model is again, they don't have to wait till you sell the property, uh, to get their money out. Uh, the fact is they're, they're getting their cash back and they're, they're a long-term investor. So it doesn't matter if you sell or not, they've got their money back. Right. Uh, so that, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. And if they ever want to sell their, their percentage of their equity, they can always do that on the, on the open market or whatever that looks like. So if they want their equity out, they can do that. But um, why? It's paying cash flow. Yeah, no, it ends on a monthly basis. They don't have any money. It's like a little annuity that pays them every single month. And that gr the equity grows over time, you know? Right. So it's, um, it's a sweet deal for them. It's an awesome deal for them. And it's a good deal for me you know, structuring and putting all the work in. And it's a good deal for, you know, either my team who's acting as a local operator or whoever our joint venture partner is, you know, like I do deals in Texas and Oklahoma, but that's because I have a joint venture partner that I trust who understands construction inside and out. And it allows more equity for them to be compensated as well because there's a lot of, there's a lot of work that goes into this. It's a heavy lift on a lot of these apartment buildings and if they have their entire team working on this and they're not being compensated, you know, for 12 or 18 months, they deserve more equity in the project than in a traditional syndication where you're doing all the work. And you're, I mean, I mean, traditional syndications usually don't work for big value ads and stuff like, like mine, not, not that much. But um, if I was going to buy something stabilized, I was going to go buy the empire state building for, you know, a billion dollars. And uh, um, it was already good to go. And I don't like traditional syndication makes sense there. It's management's right. in place. I don't have to do a bunch of work like that. That could make sense. But for the deals that we're doing, we're putting in so much work and taking on so much responsibility that um, everybody just needs to be compensated fairly for it. And I think the way that we've structured it where, again, we're in the boat, rowing in the same direction, visions and goals are aligned for both investors and operators. It, it's a win-win for everybody. And I think that's why I'm, I've, I've had as much success as I've had is because everybody realizes how, how fair it is. No, uh, I love it. I love it. Um, Tim, I, I want to shift gears here if we could for a minute. Um, as I mentioned to you before we uh, started the call by day, I'm a, an insurance broker and, and in insurance, we do risk management. We uh, try and work with our clients on a couple of different strategies um, uh, to manage the risk, either A, uh, avoid the risk, B, minimize the risk, or, or C, transfer the risk, which is essentially what an insurance policy is. And uh, I've been asking all of my guests as of late, and would love to ask you uh, if you could speak to what you see as the biggest risk. And I uh, just want to make sure that, uh, you know, that I'm not necessarily looking for an insurance related uh, risk, but uh, real estate as a whole, you're saying, right? Yeah, just, yeah, on, on the spectrum of uh, real estate investing and, and, and real estate, if you could answer the question, what is your biggest risk? Sure, great question. Um, and I, I pay a lot of attention to this because I've seen people make a lot of money and lose a lot of money in real estate. And I want to make sure that I'm not making the same mistakes. Um, the, the, the biggest risk in me and my model and my business is probably tightening up of, of lending, tightening up of, of uh, the banking. And so when I, you know, how do you mitigate that? Right. Um, because my model is based on refinancing in 12 or 18 months. So one thing I could do is if I see the market shifting, I could refinance sooner and I just don't get to take out like the refi cash out refi proceeds, right? I can, I can refinance back out at my basis into long-term debt at any time. The reason I wait until 12 months is typically because we can pull some money off the table, distribute it, it pads the investors returns a little bit and uh, makes them happy. It makes me more liquid to go qualify for more loans and things like that. But if I didn't, 
uh, if, if I didn't feel confident where the market would be 12 months from now, I could definitely refinance sooner um, and, and at least get all my investors their money back out and then just have uh, long-term debt in place and then we could ride out any sort of storm. Um, the other thing that I do is I underwrite my projects as if it's going to be um, the loan to value is going to drop by five to 10% over the course of the next 12, 18 months. And then I also underwrite my projects as if the interest rates are going to bump. Like right now, my interest rates, I'm, I'm going through a refi right now. My interest rates 4.6% and um, I'm underwriting my deals at 5.5% right now for anything that I'm acquiring today. So do I think they're going to jump that much? I don't think so. Um, but I want to be prepared for in case they do. So I'm underwriting it in a pretty conservative fashion, making sure I'm making the offers at the price points that we need. And I'm in at such a low cost basis. I'm buying at ho such wholesale prices that things would really have to shift hard for me to not be able to at least um, cash out my investors at the end of the day. So again, I'm, I'm you know, 30 to 40% below market values today. And um, you know, for traditional syndicators, when they're looking out trying to forecast five years from now, that's really hard. We could have three different presidents over the course of the next five years, right? right. Versus, versus forecasting out 12 months, it's a little bit more predictable of where the market's going to be in 12 months from now. You know, interest rates aren't going to be at 18% or anything like that. Uh, could they bump up maybe a half a point or a point? Yeah, th that might happen. Could lending tighten up a little bit? Yeah, that could happen. But, you know, I'm at the point today where I have a big enough balance sheet and enough performing assets and enough cash flow coming in where even if the market shifts, I'll still be a, a, a bankable. You know, I'll still be able to put long term debt in place, just maybe at a little bit lower of a loan to value. Um, and so, so that's, that's really my greatest risk, uh, in my business. And, you know, if worst case scenario, I gotta, I gotta ride out the storm and, uh, we can't refinance back out. My investors know that they're still going to earn their 10% preferred rate of return on their money. And they're okay with that. And if they have to ride it out, you know, 24 or 18 or 36 or 48 months, they're okay doing that. We have the asset. We're at a low enough basis. We could sell it if we needed to, or we could hang on to it. The cash flow is enough. The debt service coverage is high enough where we're able to cover all those expenses. No, I love it. I love the uh, conservative nature of your underwriting and, and uh, you know, how you kind of walk through that all the way through and, and uh, stress test the deal. It makes a lot of sense. No, I appreciate that. So Tim, uh, where can the listeners go if they would like to learn more or connect with you? I appreciate that. Um, I, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm pretty active on social media. Find me on Facebook and uh, connect with me there. I put out a ton of free content there. I put out a ton of free content on my web on my website, which is legacywealthholdings.com. Um, I just launched a podcast too, legacywealthshow.com. Um, you guys can connect with me there or, um, you know, I, I do the little bit of the coaching stuff. So if anybody wants to kind of leverage up or get some education on how to buy apartment buildings, uh, my event's called commercial empire, commercialempire.com. Check that out. And, um, no, I appreciate it. It's been an awesome conversation, Darren. Really appreciate it. I think you asked some, some phenomenal questions and, uh, again, appreciate all the value and stuff that you give to the marketplace and to, uh, your listeners. It's, uh, it's been incredible. Well, Tim, I appreciate all that. And we'll be sure to list all the uh, ways people can connect with you in the show notes. Uh, I want to say thanks again for taking the time. I've, I've enjoyed it, learned a lot, and I uh, hope we can do it again soon. Thanks, Darren. All right. For our listeners, if you like this episode, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Remember, the more you know, the more you grow. That's all we've got this week. Until next time, thanks for listening to Commercial Real Estate Pro Networks, CREPN Radio.